During October, November, and December 1966, the United States completed the Gemini program, achieving this nation's second major step in space. This was the final mission, Gemini 12, flown by James Lovell, command pilot, and Edwin Aldrin, pilot. In other areas, preparations were underway for the first manned Apollo Earth orbital mission, and qualification of Apollo Saturn V hardware moved steadily forward despite imposing technical problems. In the Gemini program, primary objectives of Gemini 12, the final mission, included a rendezvous and dock with an Agena target vehicle and extravehicular activity. EVA excursions on two previous missions were terminated early because of astronaut fatigue and overheating. The problem had caused concern as to man's ability to work effectively in extravehicular free space. To prepare the Gemini 12 pilot for the job of evaluating extravehicular operations, extensive underwater simulations had been incorporated into the EVA training plan. Astronaut Aldrin became familiar with the sensations and tasks of extravehicular activity. He familiarized himself with EVA equipment, including hand holds and body restraints, designed to reduce the amount of physical effort he would have to expend to stabilize himself in space. Gemini 12 was launched November 11th. Rendezvous with the Agena was accomplished on the third revolution. The mission provided new experience and confidence in manually computed rendezvous, in docking, and in alternate mission pre-planning. Cancellation of an Agena experiment enabled the crew to immediately divert to another objective, the first photography of a solar eclipse from space. During extravehicular operations, astronaut Aldrin accomplished a complete schedule of work tasks designed to evaluate task equipment and workloads. Nineteen work tasks were accomplished, such as torquing bolts and making electrical connections, jobs that would be applicable to future manned space operations. During his three extravehicular periods, including a record two hours and nine minutes on umbilical EVA, astronaut Aldrin experienced no noticeable fatigue or overheating. Experience and data gained from earlier EVA missions had led to the introduction of adaptive training, carefully planned work and rest periods, and the use of handholds and body restraints. As a result of such preparation, the mission proved that man can perform complex, long-duration work outside a spacecraft. Other mission objectives included the gathering of additional scientific and technological data through the use of 14 onboard experiments, such as terrain, weather, and star photography. These were part of over 50 basic types of onboard experiments conducted during the Gemini program as a whole. A technological experiment employed a 100-foot-long Agena tether which had been attached to the spacecraft by astronaut Aldrin during EVA. The experiment was a significant first in proving that with the aid of a tether, the slight difference in the pull of gravity, or gravity gradient, between the Agena and Gemini spacecraft could stabilize the two vehicles in a coasting configuration, a mode that promises to save maneuvering fuel in future station-keeping exercises. With virtually all mission objectives accomplished, the Gemini 12 crew retrofired and descended through the Earth's atmosphere. The mission concluded a program of substantial achievements in developing an operational manned spaceflight capability, a capability to conduct rendezvous and docking, long-duration flights, extended maneuvers in space, sustained extravehicular activity, scientific and engineering experiments, and controlled reentry. The Gemini flight program came to a close with a splashdown of Gemini 12 at 2.21 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, November 15th. The knowledge and experience gained from Gemini will find direct application in Apollo and other future manned spaceflight programs.
In the Apollo program, several problem areas were being met and overcome in the process of qualifying Apollo uprated Saturn I hardware for the first manned missions. At the Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 34, all components of the Apollo uprated Saturn launch vehicle for the first manned mission had been erected and were in checkout. During this period, acceptance firing tests of a later first stage revealed that four of its engines contained the wrong material in its turbopump blades. Investigation of all engines on remaining stages revealed that a total of ten engines contained the substandard parts. The one affected engine on the first manned mission launch vehicle was removed and returned to the contractor for rework. The engine will be reinstalled early in the next quarter with no impact on the first manned mission launch schedule. The spacecraft for the first manned mission had completed the majority of pre-flight checkouts, including altitude tests in the Kennedy Space Center's altitude chamber. It was during this period that two major problem areas came to light. Change out of the service propulsion system's fuel tanks was ordered when it was determined that the tanks may have been damaged during manufacturing tests. Similar testing procedures had caused the destruction of another service module at North American Aviation, Downey, California. Another problem area was encountered in the environmental control unit for the first manned Apollo spacecraft. The environmental control unit is the responsibility of North American, which subcontracted its development to Air Research, Los Angeles. Correction of a component design problem had forced replacement of the spacecraft's original environmental control unit. A coolant leak, which developed later, required the unit's second removal and factory checkout. The changeout was duplicated on a ground test spacecraft shown here at the Manned Spacecraft Center. The environmental control unit will be among all spacecraft systems monitored during the first manned Apollo mission. The flight will serve as a manned Earth orbital checkout of spacecraft systems. Crew training for the first manned Apollo flight included manned altitude chamber tests at the Kennedy Space Center. The prime crew for the first mission, astronauts Virgil Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chafee, participated in altitude chamber tests of the first Apollo spacecraft for manned flight to help verify the performance of spacecraft systems in a simulated space environment. Additional flight crew training was conducted in the newly completed Apollo mission simulator at the Kennedy Space Center. Preparations were also underway at the Kennedy Space Center for the first lunar module mission. Launch vehicle components were delivered for pre-erection checkout. They will be erected at Launch Complex 37 during the next quarter. At Grumman Aircraft, Beth Page, New York, the ascent stage of the first flight article lunar module was moved into the final assembly area for equipment and systems installation. The module will be launched in an unmanned Earth orbital test to help qualify its propulsion systems for manned lunar missions. Both the first manned command module and unmanned lunar module flights will lay the groundwork for future rendezvous missions in which command and lunar modules will dock in space. The spacecraft and launch vehicles for Apollo rendezvous and docking missions were in various stages of manufacture. At North American, Downey, the command and service modules for the first rendezvous and docking spacecraft were stacked for initial systems tests. Flight crews were announced for the first rendezvous and docking missions late in the quarter. The stages for the last of 12 uprated Saturn I launch vehicles were in production. At NASA's Michoud Assembly Facility, New Orleans, Chrysler neared completion of fabrication work and was about to begin assembly of the 12th first stage. And at Douglas Aircraft, Huntington Beach, California, liquid hydrogen tank fabrication was essentially complete for the 12th uprated Saturn I second stage. Stage assembly was due to start in January. 
Final systems qualification continued for Apollo rendezvous and docking spacecraft. The first parachute test was successfully conducted under simulated high altitude abort conditions. An onboard camera recorded deployment of the main parachute bags. The test imposed the most severe loadings anticipated for Apollo parachutes. At NASA's White Sands test facility, advanced service propulsion system testing was started, including the first lunar mission duty cycle firing. At the Manned Spacecraft Center, lunar module structural systems were flight qualified in launch and boost vibration tests. In the Apollo Saturn V program, efforts directed toward achieving early flight successes were met by several major obstacles. At North American, Downey, the spacecraft for the first Apollo Saturn V mission had been completely assembled and was in final checkout. However, during pressure tests of the service propulsion system, one of the fuel tanks ruptured, damaging the other fuel and oxidizer tanks and destroying the service module structure. The problem was traced to methanol or methyl alcohol used in fuel tank pressurization tests. The fluid under pressure caused unanticipated stress corrosion to the titanium fuel tanks. Methanol was used because its flow properties were similar to those of the module's hypergolic fuel. It was also non-explosive and evaporated quickly from fuel lines and tanks. The damaged service module was replaced by the module previously scheduled for the second Apollo Saturn V mission. Following integrated testing, the spacecraft was shipped to the Kennedy Space Center in late December for use on the first unmanned Apollo Saturn V mission. In Saturn V launch vehicle manufacturing, problems were encountered in several second stage flight articles. During post manufacturing inspections at North American Aviation Seal Beach, California, cracks were discovered in feed line components and structural members of the second and third flight articles. The cracks were repaired and methods of manufacturing and handling have been devised to minimize the cracking problem in remaining stages. The third second stage flight article was accidentally damaged at North American Seal Beach following tank component installation. The impact on the stage delivery is being assessed. Second stage problems extended into acceptance testing. At NASA's Mississippi Test Facility, earlier qualification test difficulties required the use of the first second stage flight article for combined final qualification and pre-flight acceptance test programs. During preparations for the first static firing, inspections revealed cracks similar to those discovered in the second and third flight articles. A leak was also discovered in the liquid oxygen tank. Fixes were applied and checkout continued. The stage was successfully tested in a full duration 384 second firing on December 1st. Following an abortive second firing attempt in which a faulty firing probe resulted in engine shutdown immediately after ignition, a second firing was successfully accomplished on December 30th. The stage will be shipped to the Kennedy Space Center in the next quarter to support the first Apollo Saturn V launch. At the Marshall Space Flight Center, the third Saturn V first stage flight article successfully passed its acceptance firing test. It was the first Saturn V stage built by the Boeing Company at the Mashu Assembly Facility. It was also the last Saturn V first stage acceptance firing to be conducted at Marshall. Remaining acceptance tests will be held at the Mississippi Test Facility. To increase confidence in the performance of the Saturn V third stage engine, 
J-2 engine tests continued in altitude chamber firings at the Air Force's Arnold Engineering Development Center, Tullahoma, Tennessee. During the quarter, the first cutoff and reignition test was performed at a simulated altitude of 82,000 feet. The engine's restart capability in space will be essential to Apollo lunar missions. Facilities to handle the first Apollo Saturn V missions were being readied at the Kennedy Space Center. The checkout of Pad A of Launch Complex 39 was completed using the Saturn V facilities checkout vehicle. Following propellant loading and vehicle facility compatibility demonstrations, the facilities checkout vehicle was returned to the vehicle assembly building for demating. In the vehicle assembly building, erection proceeded on the first Saturn V flight vehicle. A spacer was substituted for the North American second stage, which was still in acceptance testing at the Mississippi test facility. Additionally, during the reporting period, the Marshall Space Flight Center delivered the automatic checkout tapes to facilitate the start of the vehicle's pre-launch and launch test programs, and the Manned Spacecraft Center announced the flight crew for the first manned Apollo Saturn V mission. In space sciences, data to aid the evaluation of Apollo lunar landing sites continued to be gathered by the Lunar Orbiter Program managed by NASA's Langley Research Center. Lunar Orbiter 2 relayed some of the most detailed lunar photography obtained to date, including the first close-up view of the crater Copernicus. The crater measures 60 miles in diameter and 2 miles deep. If designated Apollo objectives can be achieved on early uprated Saturn I missions, remaining vehicles are being considered for use in orbital workshop operations. A mock-up of an uprated Saturn I experimental second stage to be used for investigating the feasibility of such a workshop was displayed at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Entry would be gained through an airlock connecting the stage with a docked command module. Construction of developmental airlock hardware for the orbital workshop was underway at McDonnell Aircraft, St. Louis. During an actual mission, a second stage would be ignited and would carry its attached command module into Earth orbit. The command module's flight crew would then detach the module, turn it around, and dock with a spent stage. The crew would purge the liquid hydrogen tank of residual propellant, and enter the tank to set up housekeeping facilities and equipment for scientific and technological experiments. A developmental airlock was delivered to the Manned Spacecraft Center where hatch designs will be verified in underwater ingress-egress tests. Douglas Aircraft, meanwhile, proceeded with outfitting of the first orbital workshop stage. Handhold attach points and cables for a propellant purging system were installed. In the final months of 1966, the United States achieved its intermediate goal in space with the completion of the Gemini program. The knowledge and experience gained in Gemini broadened the technology base for the Apollo program, where despite time-consuming problems, the stage was set for the first manned Apollo-operated Saturn I flight, and where in Apollo Saturn V preparations, major strides continued to be made toward achieving this nation's goal of extended manned spaceflight investigations.